one. Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to No Center, No Limits, a panel discussion on creating and exhibiting art in digital environments. So today, um, uh, myself, Kat Blumke, and Jonathan Carroll over there, uh, over this way, this way. Yeah, I got it the first time. Uh, your uh, <laughs> The Mackenzie Art Gallery's digital exhibitions consultants were joined by Katie Mickack, who is our curator of our current digital art exhibit here at the Mackenzie Art Gallery, There Is No Center. We're joined as well from with uh, several artists from the exhibition, including Thoreau Backer, Adrian Methusik, Tom Sherman, Fallon Samard, and Shen Yi. Uh, for those of you who perhaps are just tuning in and haven't seen the exhibit yet, There Is No Center is an experimental online exhibition adapting the visual language of video games to explore how the presentation of art in digital environments shifts the viewer's role as players and challenges exhibition norms. So you can see it for yourself at thereisno.gallery. We will also be taking a few peeks into it uh, over the course of tonight, but also recommend at the end of the evening you checking it out for yourself because there's a couple of these concepts that you'll, I think you'll want to explore uh, as an avatar. And so today's programming and the exhibition itself is part of an ongoing project from the Mackenzie Art Gallery called Detail. And Detail, or the Digital Exhibitions Toolkit and Art Installation Launcher, supports the development of digital art exhibitions for digital platforms. So in partnership with arts organizations and curators, we're developing this resource for public release in 2024, but you get to see uh, little bits along the way uh, that presented as through these exhibitions. So There Is No Center is one of our pilot project exhibitions demonstrating this new technology. We're very grateful for Katie McCack and all the participating artists who have contributed their work to this new initiative. And I'd like to also note that we, um, as Mackenzie Art Gallery, are acknowledging the support of the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund in, with this detail project as well. And all of our activities that occur in the digital space um, couldn't be possible without the land that we're gathered on. So today I'd like to acknowledge um, the Mackenzie Art Gallery's location, which is located on Treaty 4 territory. And that is the homeland of the Cree, the Soto, the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, and Métis peoples. As well, the artists joining us today are largely gathered on the traditional territory of many nations, which includes the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. This area is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Jonathan and I are joining you from Isekatik in Mi'kmaq, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And you on the other side of my screen are gathered wherever you are. And I thank you for joining us on this live stream. And you, the aforementioned you on the other side of the screen, you are also encouraged to participate tonight, whether um, that's through making your comments, um, just giving a like, share and subscribe to the video, uh, or uh, yeah, just giving some good, uh, some good vibes. And if you were wondering how to do that, uh, if you are watching, through uh, the embedded stream on the Mackenzie Art Gallery's website. Just click that video title to be redirected to the Twitch stream with chat compatibility. And if you're already there on Twitch or on YouTube or on Facebook, um, the chat can be found on the right side of the video if you're watching it from a computer. And then it's at the bottom of the video for a mobile device. And uh, you've got all those different options of platforms to be watching it from. So just make sure that you're logged into your account um, for whatever platform that may be. So with that uh, housekeeping of how to write a comment uh, done, um, we will be reviewing those as we go through as we go throughout the night. So please just drop in whatever you're, is on your mind and we'll make sure to come back to it. Um, I'd like to uh, hand things off to Katie to get this event started. Um, Katie, <laughs> it's uh, the floor is yours, the virtual floor. Thank you. Um, I'm coming to you from Stratford, Ontario in a hot windowless, well, window, no windows can open attic, but I have a fan on, so I'm good. Um, I just wanted to do a quick introduction. 
Um, and then just dive right into the panel, which uh, should be casual and conversational. And I'm hoping to hear from the audience as well. So feel, please feel free to send your questions along. Okay, so when I was approached by Kat Blumke and Jonathan Carroll to participate in a new series of online exhibitions for the Mackenzie Gallery, I was massively complimented and excited to explore the still emerging area of exhibition development. Um, I was also extremely curious as to how online exhibitions might be pushed into new directions. I've only curated a handful of online exhibitions and they've only showcased exclusively new art. This exhibition itself doesn't show that art per se, but works that were adapted to an online format. Um, the one show that I did do that involved outside net art and online work happened in 2020 right after the pandemic shut down. And the program, uh, the program found there, there was, I found out there was much to learn to, to learn about curating this type of work. And because that show was so rapidly developed and because of the speed in which it came together on the curatorial end, there were limitations for how the works could be exhibited. Primarily, this was a web page. I noticed that many works around this time when shows started going online started becoming in web pages with hyperlinks or links or uh, pop outs to, to exhibit work. So given the opportunity to explore more deeply what online shows can do, I was very interested in seeing how to best challenge and take advantage of online spaces. So one thing that was really interesting and surprising to me was the preliminary conversations that happened with Kat and Jonathan and how to approach what was possible in this context. Um, I was initially struck with the language used to describe the projects. They spoke about user experience, prototypes, storyboards, the potential of collecting viewer metrics. Uh, these are terms I rarely hear in the art world. So it was very exciting and an inspiring starting point for the show. And it kind of changed the direction in which I was uh, approaching looking at work. Um, the general starting thesis of There is No Center was to explore the concept of translation, not ling linguistic translation, but mainly how physical artworks or installations or digital artworks, which were meant to be seen in physical spaces, can be translated into digital spaces. Um, the work selected came together either from pure research, previously curated versions of an artwork. Uh, in one case, there was a physical sculpture of the work, which we'll get to. Suggestions which came about through collaborative conversations. Um, or just artists I admired and I approached to work with under this concept. I wanted to see how they responded to the idea of moving their work into an online space. Perhaps they hadn't before. Um, the works in the show by these artists uh, and the artists on these panels to me are very interesting, important and timely artists. I think the works, I think that they all become I think all the works become a new version of themselves in this online exhibition, or they challenge how 3D navigatable digital exhibitions up until now mainly operate. Um, what started to formulate in terms of the curation was the notion that not that there were no physical limitations for the show. There were no connections to the laws of physics, the boundaries of physical space. So why not bring in works, works which should capitalize on this while also putting the viewer in a first person experience? Another element that began to emerge was the viewer's navigation and how it might be a meaning, meaningful element for framing the overall exhibition. In my curatorial essay for There Is No Center, I explore how all the works in the show inherently reference conventions of video games, especially open world games, and ask if viewers can become players when shows are online and presented in a similar fashion to online game platforms. However, for this panel, no center, no limit. I would like to dive more deeply into each of the works and how they fit into online this online exhibition space and create a meaningful new experience for the viewers and the artists alike. Okay, so panel discussion time. I just wanted to start with a really general question for the artists. Um, I wanted to ask about your overall experience with this process. Uh, of translating your artwork, which was perhaps not made for online viewership, or maybe you never saw it in this context before into this digital online space. Um, and I'm curious if there was any specific elements came out or uh, was there something similar to online? Was it different? Was it surprising? Did your relationship change to the work at all? So just a very general question. And maybe uh, as an opportunity, you could also present the work uh, in the show a little bit more say whatever you like. But I was wondering if we could start with Thoreau Backer, who uh, created the work VR Cat, and uh, his response to this question. So Thoreau? Sure, thanks, Katie. Uh, really nice to join with you all again for a second time. It's kind of feels a bit like deja vu, but um, <laughs> such such a great, great group. So, so nice to be back. Um, a lot of my past practice uh, was to do with physical sculpture. And though, uh, although I've been 
in, uh, interested in uh, virtual spaces and uh, video games. I, I hadn't really combined those things together. So I think what, what was really neat for me about this show was uh, taking something kind of fixed, uh, something static and kind of uh, bringing it to life. And um, the last time we all met, uh, I gave lo lots of credit uh, both to you and to Jonathan and Kat um, for our uh, uh, ongoing talks and kind of brainstorming. Um, I think that I, I like definitely would not have been able to come up with something as fun and uh, interesting without the input of a number of people. I think that that also speaks to um, game development in, in general. Um, oftentimes games take huge teams of people, right? Hundreds, thousands, uh, multi-million dollar budget. So yeah, I guess I would just say for me, the uh, sculpture into the movement was really cool and uh, working with, with the team was also great. Great, and just to uh, kind of clarify a little bit more about that project specifically, VR Cat um, is an artwork that was shown in uh, another context. I worked in another gallery previously before the pandemic at the Living Art Center, and I was able to include a physical sculpture of the VR Cat, which Thoreau sculpted in VR space using an Oculus and VR controllers. And knowing um, his relationship with the development of the of the work which was to there's there's the oculus which was to um uh create an object that could reference a commercial toy but also potentially and hopefully create multiples of this object so something that could be um molded and um replicated over and over again and not having maybe the opportunity or maybe needing more funding to make that kind of realization happen how can we expand this singular digital or singular analog physical digital Feigl object, which is a combination of both those worlds into uh, basically realizing the vision of you of the artist as being a, uh, a multiple an infinite multiple. So when you approach it in the space, um, it's a white void. I always kind of thought about this as like a matrix kind of space where in that scene in the matrix where the guns roll in and it, there's nothing there. And Neo is kind of like being introduced to these concepts of the matrix. But in this in exhibition in for Thoreau's work, uh, there's a singular box that when you approach, you can click in a cat, okay, <laughs> there it is. So you can press the box and versions of this cat will come out over and over again. So I think it was a pretty, uh, for me at least, uh, one of the works that translated very much in this exhibition. Um, Great. Okay. Um, would anybody else like to talk about their experience with? Actually, I'm going to make this smaller. I'll just belatedly um, share head into uh, Thoreau's uh, piece, um, but can can you talk? Sure. Um, maybe while we're sort of talking about the figles, the physical digital elements, if I could ask for Fallon to speak. About So I'm not sure if you were here at the beginning of the question, but basically I was asking the group, um, was there any specific elements that came out by translating this work into this online space? And did your relationship with the work change at all? Um, so if you don't mind introducing your piece a little bit more and how it came to be in this space, in this exhibition. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, my work, um, is originally from a meme series that I created, sort of coming out of like internet culture and like um, meme culture. Um, and so the series is called uh, Bodies That Monetize and it's essentially like a series of memes that I made um, on my phone, just sort of like learning how to study and uh, considering sort of photography. Um, and I sort of made them uh, as a part of my thesis project um, but what they intended to do was sort of look at the intersections of um, like in indigenous connections to land and um, sort of spell out uh, what this connection looks like um, fr from land and then also uh, the mental health implications of of what that 
what that sort of looks like. So each piece sort of um, illustrates kind of these uh, mental health afflictions like uh, like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, like abandonment, anxiety, and all these other kinds of uh, mental health uh, afflictions that can happen. Um, and that are sort of broadly uh, in, involved in uh, mental health considerations. Um, and then so uh, I they originally printed them on these sort of large scale uh, images. Um, coming, so they were in the phone and then they were printed on the phone and now they're back into sort of a computer, which is really cool. Um, and they are actually like very small file sizes. Um, so I think they're like, uh, I'm not sure exactly how uh, big or not they are, but they are pretty small. Um, and they're sort of meant to have this sort of uh, grainy effect. But it's really cool to see sort of how the um, the the quality sort of changes in each one of them um, and how sort of uh, there's still, although the quality changes, there's still these sort of aspects of um, color and text and sort of um, messaging <laughs> and continues, uh, which is really cool. Uh, and then in the in the um, space, it's sort of we're, we're thinking through the space of like, um, like sort of like a warehouse or like a sort of an, an abandoned warehouse kind of deal. And then uh, we're thinking it would be really cool to also add like what what would these sort of pieces look like if you added sort of like the the trees and landscapes around them uh, and place them in these in these areas. So it gives them it gives it kind of like. Like a like an a signage uh, kind of appeal to them, but in inside a space, which sort of creates these uh, other uh, layered meanings for them, uh, especially with having like the trees and like the shrubs sort of brushing up against them, uh, which is really cool. I I, I think uh, ended up it ended up looking really really cool. Yeah. I, what I, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh. I was gonna say what I really love about this, well, there's so many things I love about the way that this work came together over the process of this exhibition, but one of the things that really attracted to me to this piece um, was that they were memes or they were images referencing meme language, but they were never shown in a meme context. So they were never existed on social media or Instagram at all. Um, and um, through reading your writing about this work, uh, learning that the that thought process was from the beginning, that these these memes, this visual language of the meme is going to exist entirely in a physical gallery space. I believe you showed it at Blank Gallery in Toronto the first time. Um, so I, I really loved the, uh, the, the disconnect or maybe this disassociation from the format of the image and the location in which it was shown. Um, so, so that I think is another layer of the work where you're speaking about uh, these feelings and this almost like a disassociation from feeling and through the metaphor of how you created and showed the image. So could you maybe talk a little bit more about that? Oops, yeah, definitely. That's, that's a really, uh really um cool way to like think through think through it it's like uh definitely like uh like a like like you're saying like a disassociation of like uh like physical and digital spaces and like uh how they exist in all these different digital spaces which i think is really uh is uh like such a good way to to put that especially like um the sort of mental health aspects around navigating um different different online spaces and then how you navigate you navigate physical spaces and then also navigate online digital spaces like simultaneously sometimes especially when you can like just sort of walk around with your phone like all the time so you're kind of always in a, a digital space in a physical space uh, yeah 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 I think the process and um of, of that the initial creation of these images and then it's circling back into this digital space and then 
uh, through our conversations, bringing back this sort of game element, which maybe we can get to a little bit later in, my, in another question, but that was a really interesting process to see uh, the conversations emerge and and maybe like thinking about it, how things change over the process of building the exhibition. So the exhibition allowed flexibility um, for adding the trees in basically later on. Um, but if we could hold on that for, for a moment, um, thank you so much. Thank um, you. Yeah, I'm wondering uh, if either Shen, would you like to to speak about your relationship with the work and seeing it in this online context, if anything changed? I know that when you initially made your piece that called Belly of the Whale, it was made for an IRL gallery context and involved lots of different types of technology, uh, including EEG headsets, um, uh, VR, et cetera. So this is quite a different version of that project. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about where it came from and how you think it's operating within this digital space. Um, yeah, sure. Thank you for for the question. Um, yeah, I guess it initially um, the the VR work was um, created uh, in the context of a three gallery exhibition. And uh, there was the intention to uh, feature or involve this work in all three uh, gallery space at the same time because they kind of overlap uh, in terms of the showing time. And um, in the first, actually the first exhibi exhibition, which was at Varley Art Gallery, uh, uh, we, we were showing a... Um, what I call the port, uh, the porthole of a um, screen cap of the VR environment, which has no user at all. It was purely, it was an empty uh, ship. Um, but uh, the audience were uh, will be able to see uh, the kind of interior design of the ship and also like the uh, look at the ship, cruise ship uh, from... Um, you know, the other angles. And then the second iteration, which is Belly of the Whale uh, in its VR form, which was at InterAccess, um, because uh, uh, there was another work of mine in the series, which uh, it's like interactive. So there was already a, a, a environment that's like immersive. Um, so, so I actually added a, a component which is uh, like you were saying, the the um, brainwave uh, induced soundscape to add it, to be added into this uh, immersiveness. Um, so so right in the real um, live version, um, the uh, the I guess the user who will put on the VR headset, but at the same time also also the the E lip the brainwave headset. So the idea is while the user is in the virtual reality, mm -hmm. um, their brainwave, um, I guess the, the the changes of the brainwave signals will induce um, or um, modulate uh, the sound of ping noise, which mm -hmm. to another user who's, well, not user, like more like an audience, member who are not inside of the virtual reality, to them, it will, it will sound like the ocean. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, that was uh, the, the context of the uh, IRL version. And, and then for, for the online, online version, um, it's, it's interesting because um, I think it, there was a little bit of um, technical, uh, limitation or even I, I personally really embrace uh, a glitch. Um, yeah, so basically it, it visually it won't look exactly the same like the um, I guess the the local version of the uh, unity file if you uh, if you experience it on a, in a, like a PC um, with a VR um, like an oculus or something. Um, but it, it actually adds uh, add to me like a, another layer of um, abstractness um, because for some reason the wireframe sort of gets even 
um yeah that's i i think maybe jonathan can speak for for this uh this this change but it's there is an aesthetic difference between the online version and i think it it makes it even more like the environment for the you know the, the ghost users and like for these like halo and uh pass uh user pass yeah so this i think we're, what we're seeing is one of these paths develop <laughs> on the screen. So just to, to expand on that, um, for this uh, iteration of it, so Shen, what Shen's mentioning about the, almost like the glitch or the image becoming more minimal in a way, mm -hmm. like these are more um, realistic looking linear versions of chairs and they kind of turned into triangular shapes around the ship. And so, um, this piece is quite interesting, I think, in the show because it, it sort of dictated that the exhibition in its entirety should go on Firefox to be best experience. And so that to me is really interesting, too, that when you bring all these works together and they have all these different types of needs, um, that there's it's just a learning experience. And so um, <clears throat> so that in a form is a form of a glitch, too. But getting back to this pathway that we saw emerging um, and one of the things that I think is so fascinating about this work is that there is this real-time illustration of users in the space that appear as these white ghostly paths. And uh, they should be existing for the duration of the exhibition and building over time. So, so this is a, uh, a history of the users that have gone through the exhibition. And it also is a almost like a real-time gathering space where there's no real interaction, there can't be any other real interaction other than um, these uh, representations of other users in the space. So as a networked piece on the internet, I think that it's uh, quite interesting. And uh, maybe this is the wrong way to say it, but like really heavy technically. So it did have um, these limitations, but I think that it, it works out quite well. And it's really exciting for me that, that it's part of this exhibition for sure. Um, so yeah, so thank you for that. And there's other things I would like to ask about this as well, but I wanted to get to Tom Sherman um, talking about his experience of seeing a <laughs> video work from 1987, exclusive memory about training artificial intelligence through a phone call or a digital phone. Um, what it's like to see that in an online exhibition environment, uh, what's going on? What's going on with your your feedback on that? I'm so curious. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I I have to say I was sort of shocked when I <laughs> when I worked with you three to put the actual virtual gallery together, mm -hmm. and um, I really hadn't thought it out and really didn't know exactly what I was doing. I was really uh, happy that Katie was interested in these experience transfers that I had made in 1987 to an intelligent machine in its infancy, I decided to use natural language and improvisational English to describe things that the machine hadn't experienced yet. <clears throat> and that included taking a stationary robot, a robotic device, and moving it out into the environment. <clears throat> so I was pretty happy to see that idea and of course you know the the current uh, buzz environment with with all of these uh, artificial intelligent uh, image and sound generators um you know all using natural language and you know it, it just seemed very intoxicating so then i thought all right well i'm just going to install my video uh <laughs> in this in this virtual space and came up with this crazy gallery, you know, as we had a conversation and it's kind of like a giant uh, convention center uh, gallery. It's kind of uh, for mass masses of people to move through. Um, but it has these other qualities, including uh, that I was able to place an, uh, an image that I had made around 1986 as this sort of secret image for this uh, machine culture. So I was, I was first of all, I was really kind of shocked when I finally got in there and 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 thought saw what I was doing. And I always thought I also felt a bit idiotic to join an online digital show um, um, with a radio piece, you know. 
because it's really uh, the piece is based in natural language. It's an acoustic piece, and it's really about my voice and about talking about images and situations and perspectives and things like that. So I thought, you know, this is I got my hands tied behind my back here. I'm kind of going in here. But what I what I feel about it after living with it for a while and after going through a period of being embarrassed in a way by its primitive nature, uh, some of the things that don't work about it are the most interesting things to me. And that is that when you put yourself in a context where you have a highly charged visual environment, where you have the, the, the manifestation of an imaginative space, uh, let's imagine a limitless space and, and how we would create that imagination concretely through animation, <laughs> um, through this kind of automated drawing, et cetera. Um, you would you would create this kind of the shell of uh, of an imagination, and that's that for me also is a really terrifying experience because I have a deep fear of industrial imagination. I, I I think I spent my entire life trying to avoid industrial imagination, and uh, you know b- being brought up on Disney and sitting in the dark and having all of these visuals created, etc. It it not only set the standard for how to visualize things. But it also uh, created a tremendous limitation in terms of what I could do within the space. So then, coincidentally, it also allowed me to actually speak and think about the imagination, which is like a taboo in the arts, right? I don't think I've ever had an opportunity to talk about my imagination and the imagination of audiences. I don't know what it is, but it's just like, you know, I never had the opportunity. Then concurrently, I went and I heard a talk by a, a, a professor of, a, of aesthetic philosophy named Angela Breedenbach, and uh, she was a visiting scholar at Syracuse University. And by the way, I'm pretending, I'm playing, I'm dramatizing being a professor in 1987. Three years later, I'm hired as a tenured uh, full professor at Syracuse University. So, you know, it's it's like either be careful about what you wish for, but but anyways, so what I'm what I'm getting to is is that what I say in this in this in this work and how it's contextualized here in this virtual space, this virtual gallery, I realize that it's it's an exchange between my imagination of what it is that this machine would like to hear or needed to hear in order to be in the world, right? Mm-hmm. That the audience, when they go to the work, they're thinking also about the environment and what I'm doing in terms of my imagination, in terms of showing it concretely, explicitly, right, in a kind of artificial way, because the imagination is imagined as this kind of thing that floats around, you know, it's not it's not concrete. And uh, I think that's maybe, in a way, my aversion to digital spaces is that they're not only uh, sterile, but they're also uh, artificial, you know, so uh, there's something there. So I'm thinking about this dialogue between the audience imagination and my own imagination. And then I realize that the the binding force or the fusion of this dialogue of imaginations that is expressed concretely um, um, is the environment. It's it's the virtual gallery. It's the context by which the work is experienced, and of course, we don't we don't usually think about the environment as having an imagination, because mm-hmm. that would be an anthropomorphic kind of idea. But in fact, all environments, artificial, living, organic, whatever, have incredible imaginations, and that imagination is being expressed, right. So concurrently, we now have a trialogue of of, uh, imaginations. And for me, this awkward integration into the space has given me a tremendous insight myself into what the hell's going on here and why it doesn't work, but it works really beautifully for me because it's allowing me to understand what I'm doing. And and, um, that's that's really what I got out of it. I, I again I was shocked about how little I knew about what I was doing in, in this environment but I'm really equally shocked and pleased 
with what it's given me in terms of audience interaction, et cetera. And uh, I, I just, at this point, I just want to really thank Katie for having the the interest in that work from 1987, but but being able to be, to articulate all of this and then to be in partnership with all of the artists in the space who are doing similar things, but are thinking about them entirely differently and are much more comfortable uh, with their concrete imagination than I am. It horrifies me. <laughs> um, and you're going to say something amazing. Um, I love that. I wanted to see what would happen putting a Tom Sherman work in, in this type of environment and uh, get you on this panel to talk about it. But that, that's a great response in terms of really recognizing the contributions of so many different people for this exhibition coming together. Uh, before I speak about that, I just wanted to, to mention the conversations we had about developing your environment because you're like, oh, it's a video, we should show it in like a gallery. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna send you to the Unity store. Here's the Unity store link. Here's some examples of things you might like. What do you like? And uh, I just thought that that was really interesting. And then over video, because we're all working remotely here, uh, trying to figure out like the scale of the room through physical objects on like webcam and stuff like that. So it was a really interesting and unique process working on this. The most like IRL gallery in a way was was working with your piece in this exhibition as well, figuring out that as well. Um, okay, we have one more artist to get through this question, Adrian. Masuzik and her amazing piece, um, Interstellar Illusions, uh, in a way, kind of the most game-like piece, which uh, maybe in a, in two ways you can speak to both of these questions. I am very curious because this was the, um, the only piece, I believe, that was basically in development during this exhibition, and this is the first time it's been shown in any type of context as well in this space. And um, I'm curious to see, to know how that was to know that you were building it for an online experience, um, knowing that there was kind of these, this language and this idea around the game sort of happening. I know that the piece was in development before we even spoke about including it in the show. Um, but yeah, how was, how was this experience of seeing it all come together and, uh, and showing it online as a start? Uh, yeah, I'm really glad that it was able to be shown online. I think like, I had been working towards something with the things that it is for like uh, a year pretty much. And I hadn't really decided like what it was going to be. And then you just happened to call me like at the same time of me being like, I have to figure out how to wrap up this project. And then it was like, oh, okay, perfect. And then I thought I came up with something like small and manageable, but then I got a little carried away because I was having a good time and it ended up being a bit like sprawling. And then I, uh, I'm so grateful to have been able to work with Jonathan and Kat who like actually kind of finished some of the like interactivity of it, like getting between the scenes. Like I still don't know how that's done exactly. So I'm really glad that they were able to add that in for me. And um, I think that, yeah, I think it turned out really well. I wish that I'd uh, I don't know, made it more concise or something, but I'm really like happy with how it all turned out. I really like being able to live in this world that I've been thinking about for so long. Yeah, I, I love the sprawling sort of endless nature of this piece. And I think I'm really glad that it became that for this exhibition initially when we spoke about it you talked about it as being like a maze and I was like that's amazing that's great this is exactly what this exhibition is doing it's exploring the sort of boundlessness of digital space so um so I'm glad that you did realize that vision um and in terms of it being a game uh we you spoke briefly about this at the opening um talking about your inspiration as, as actually coming from games in some senses um and then but it's not a game. The piece is not a game, it's an environment. So can you talk about that relationship you have between building these virtual environments and maybe your interest or experience with gameplay and how do those connect? So when I first started this project, it was supposed to be like a VR environment, but I found that I got a little sick in the VR headset and then 
because I was working with landscapes like before I started working on this project and and as I continued it was a lot of landscapes it made more sense to be a more like a traditional sort of like gaming interface with just like a flat screen and walking around because moving around in VR is like it can be a problem like especially for me I get motion sickness like pretty easily and um so this is like an environment but I think that in the future it will be a game but I always like I always liked the thing with installations and media art where it's kind of like here's this endless thing like you decide how much time you spend in it like you decide like what you think about it and like if you don't like it then just move on and I think that like playing with attention spans especially now with like how short everyone's attention span like especially mine also like it's always interesting to like make such like a uh, long attention span type of games when like I pretty much have a hard time like doing that for anything else and uh my experience with video games is uh, I play a lot of video games and I really like the ones where you can look around and see interesting things um like uh adventure games and stuff like there's really interesting landscapes and then what's really fun I don't think that this is super in my project but it's always like nice to try to find a secret place that you're not supposed to be and just kind of like break the game and like go through a wall or something and I think that those kinds of uh interactions with digital spaces are really fun mm -hmm. um yeah and I wanted to ask a follow-up question before that I also wanted to acknowledge that there's two other works in this show uh one by Elizabeth La Ponce and Wes Shoyo Alvitre and collaborators, a large group of collaborators called When Rivers Were Trails, and it is a video game, a downloadable file, um, and another video game, the, two of the like strict video game mediums that were in this exhibition, those artists were unable to make it today, uh, but the second one is by Malumbe Hambe, it's called Ishu Ali Gabara, God of the Crossroads, uh, it's a 2D, 2D, 2D. 2D point and click choice bakes text game. So those are also uh, part of this exhibition. But when I went back to, to develop this, the questions for this panel tonight, um, I was thinking about how I broke up the works in my mind and then in the essay um, as related to uh, your work. I, I kind of related it to Shen's work of being goals, goalless games, wandering environments. And what I thought was really interesting, something that struck me was the um, that both of the locations that you selected to create your environment, Adrian, in your case, an abandoned interstellar resort, um, like a, a luxury resort that nobody's at. And in Shen's case, this is a, a cruise ship, a commercial cruise ship, which I'm assuming is also luxurious. So you chose these spaces that are transitional, rented, luxurious spaces. And uh, I'm just curious, um, why why those spaces appeal to you um maybe adrian you can go first yeah so i've been thinking about that a lot as i like move forward with developing this project and future projects within this body of work that i've been working on and i think for me the interest in resorts and like luxury spaces is partially uh because of social media and inaccessibility because like social media influencers are posting these like crazy uh luxury resorts where it's like five thousand dollars us a night and i think they're really pretty and it's interesting to think that like that place is just as inaccessible to me as a resort on another planet and then also having been to an all-inclusive resort like two times it's a not a real place like it's just such a strange experience of reality like you're separated from your real problems but then you're kind of like in this manufactured place and the people working there and the people living in the actual area like they're living real lives and like it's obviously like you're just living this weird fantasy but it's like a physically grounded fantasy but it's just like completely false and like for me, because my family is from Jamaica and Jamaica has like all of these resorts and that's where I've been to these resorts. And like my experience of this country I have connections to is like 
sometimes it is a family, but like most of the time it's just this like completely fake experience. And I'm, I'm super aware of it, but I think it's always interesting when like you just go for the experience and just turn your brain off and you're like, I'm just going to live in this fantasy where I don't have to pay for my meals. I do whatever I want to sleep on the beach all day. And <laughs> like, it's like nice and bad in a way. Like I think everybody should be able to sleep on the beach. It's nice, but like, it's just strange. It's just not, it's just not real. These places are really weird. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. We didn't talk about that specifically. Um, Shen, uh, do you have a response to the question? Yeah, I heavily resonate with what AJ was saying. <laughs> um, yeah, to me, it's very similar. I was also, you know, uh, been to, like, it's also coming from my personal experience on a cruise ship. Uh, these kind of all-inclusive uh resort experiences uh, feel really bizarre um i think i said this before I it was my first and probably gonna be my last cruise ship uh experience yeah like you totally feel it's a reality that feels virtual mm -hmm. um absolutely and um yeah and in, in in actually in the uh local version of the 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 vr uh, Valley of the Whale, uh, there's also a feature where um, an endless staircase will show uh, show up randomly at a position in, inside of the ship. Um, that was also uh, my interest in this kind of structure or infrastructure of, you know, a resource space or like a ship, a cruise ship specifically, and also like uh, like a shopping mall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, they, they're all like these... Um, these highly um, simulated uh, reality to me. Um, and um, the, a lot of design, for example, uh, uh, the staircase on a cruise ship or in a shopping mall, they share the same kind of function or the same kind of intention that, you know, so that you are actually just like endlessly roaming and almost trapped in this kind of loop um and yeah so yeah that on that aspect i i heavily resonate with and adrian um and um to me there's another aspect of uh uh using i guess the space as uh, the ship as a space was um uh what i was thinking a lot is the um how it's such a imagery, a metaphor, an object, or even like we can see as a phenomenon where um, it was almost a starter of uh, colonialism, right? Um, and there's that aspect. And then at the same time, for a lot of uh, people who, who are not tourists, Right, who are who have to travel or are forced to travel, like immigrants, uh, refugees. They have to um, ship was the vehicle, was the uh, the portal for them to to um, you know to go to a uh, new space. So um, so to me, there's that uh, you know. Um, the the implications of ship in general not not just a uh, cruise ship mm -hmm. to me was uh, there was an irony there right like um you know in the commercialized um uh scenario it's you know it's this luxury resort but um it actually has so many other uh functions and uh implications yeah yeah thank you for that um Wonderful. Um, thinking about spaces, uh, I wanted to return back to Fallon um, and this uh, development of where your memes, images referencing memes series was going to exist. And um, when I was reading about your work again, because a lot of it, our conversations were very like voice note and like me reading, it was really interesting working with you as well. Um, but this idea that there was something really like dark about the environment, something like violent about the environment, obviously, 
that uh, I felt was important to bring into the conversation about framing these works. And it is like a literal virtual frame that the works were put in. So um, I, I believe we talked about like a ghost town, things that were like kind of video game tropes, like a ghost town. Um, maybe there's another one, but we definitely, like we settled on the warehouse. And, uh, and, and initially it was going to be kind of like this, this large, almost like traditional gallery show in the warehouse. But then um, maybe like a month or two before the exhibition actually opened, you sent an email, which I think completely altered your piece and made it like um, really amazing was this idea of bringing in vegetation into this space. So um, can, we, can we revisit the idea of the space was related to games and then how you were, when you came to that, uh, I guess maybe it was a light bulb moment or I'm not sure how you came to that decision, but can you talk about that process of adding um, more into the video game or the warehouse space? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, great, great question. Yeah, I was really, um, I feel like I really had like a, a great um, connection with uh, Shin's piece on, um, on like how, on um, sort of like the implications of uh co colonialism and how how that um how sort of the images and this and the uh virtual spaces uh take on um like new new iterations of colonialism and how that sort of uh looks uh looks today and how it looks in in virtual spaces um not to get off topic on your question but i also wrote a um a, sh a shorter piece for um uh what was that for uh the i think it's called like uh black flash magazine and I, I basically one of the things that i was writing about is um how like photography and film were also used as methods of uh co like methods of colonization and as proof of uh colonization especially in um for like indigenous uh, context and and indigenous First Nation uh, communities, um, and I think like uh, you you can ex you can sort of extend that kind of um, analysis to uh, digital spaces for how um, how there's a sort of a continuance of uh, co colonial methods, but also a continuance of sort of the proof of um, colonization. You could also probably use the same analysis for like other things like uh, uh, ca capitalism and those kinds of things. Uh, but just to, but I just, I really liked how, um, just wanted to like jump in on uh, and, and share and share a different context from what Shen, Shen was raising. Cause yeah, I think that uh, how you brought in uh, the metaphor for like a uh, ship as like a form of colonization and how it's on your piece. I just think that that's, uh, so impactful so I, I just wanted to also say thank you for that um and i hope i i hope that that answered the question because i actually yeah okay awesome thank yeah, you that's great it was great okay um i have a question about time to jonathan and kat do, do we have a limit or can we go a little bit longer Sorry, what we we were playing chicken on who was going to unmute first. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, technically, this is, we sort of scheduled this for an hour, but uh, we started a bit late. So, um, okay, shall we go for another f fifteen minutes if that's okay with everybody? It's okay with me. I think that all the pieces are super. Lots to say. So much to all of them. So I'm really enjoying this. Um, okay, so. I think that we talked about just looking at my questions. Um, well, I guess one, hmm, maybe I'll go this direction and then we can kind of just jump in with whatever, whatever people are thinking or want to share. But I did definitely want to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge uh, John and Kat's contribution to this exhibition, uh, both in the technical and definitely a creative aspect both artists in your own right with multiple trajectories to your practice. And um, I guess I'm wondering what the experience of like developing this exhibition has been uh, in terms of like just the, the whole process of bringing it together, building maybe, 
uh just anything I'm just so curious because you're very central like you could see the show I couldn't see the show in for many portions of this the development of the exhibition with the exception of our meetings and so uh I've never worked like that and coming from a background where as a curator I, I've often been involved with the installation of shows where mm -hmm. I've been you know anal enough to be like can we move this like two centimeters over it was uh, a really fascinating experience, but I think what you brought was, uh, I don't want to say it, imagination. I think that you brought like so many great suggestions and I'm like very, very grateful for just the way in which you approached building this exhibition's world, because you did, you, bu you built this world. Um, so yeah, just any sort of thoughts that you might have related to that. That's <laughs> very uh th those are kind words so thank you uh everyone uh but i think i really i wanted to be as much of a sort of uh paintbrush in your hands as a curator as possible as well as in the artist's hands for realizing what they wanted to see but not very that's a hard thing to achieve because of the technical limitation stuff in terms of um um, Kat and I being the ones who are actually using the video game engine that we use to build the show. So um, this this project, this exhibition is part of a, a larger project we're working on at the McKinsey Art Gallery called the Digital Exhibition Toolkit and Art Installation Launcher, which is just, that's a long title just so we could have the acronym DETAIL. Mm -hmm. And so D DETAIL is a toolkit that we're building over the course of three uh, digital art exhibitions that we are hoping will make it e more easy to create digital art exhibitions in the video game engine Unity. So uh, uh, a huge aspiration I have is that it, it would be more possible for a technician like myself or even for you on your own, a curator like you, Katie, on their own to um, uh, be able to hold the paintbrush in their hands as it were in terms of uh exhibition design um uh by by building out this toolkit that has a sort of um a better degree of uh, accessibility to realizing your vision and what the you want the exhibition to be so we're we're building out that toolkit by actually like putting on uh building exhibition trying to build exhibitions and then building the tools to build those exhibitions as we're building the exhibitions in startup world it's called eating your own dog food okay. <laughs> um and so we're dog fooding it as they say um to to try to make this uh this toolkit this is the first exhibition so there's uh it was very yeah, very surprising uh, experience in a lot of ways, but also uh, exactly what we like to do, which is sort of like realizing digital art projects in general. That's that's our thing that we're lucky enough to uh, do in this context uh, with with awesome people. Um, so, like in general, it was great, and it was also sort of awesome to, in an, in a way of working. In this sort of in a video game context, we Kat and I as artists, we we make video games or we make things that are like video games, and it was fun working building these uh, the rooms in the exhibition or the world in the exhibition based on what the the prompts uh, sort of that we received from you, Katie, or from all of you uh, the artists, and trying to realize those prompts in a as as sort of a you can almost think of it like a game design challenge because we are using game design technology. So you're sort of like shoehorned into thinking about things in terms of, for example, um, how the user is going to interact this weird 3D space. That brings up a lot of uh, questions that you come across in video game design. So it was funny to, it was a very fun process to do game design through these conversations with people who are uh, coming from very different places than a game design background from the curatorial world, especially that was really fun having uh, conversations with you, Katie, and then with our colleagues at the McKenzie about what lessons about curation and what, what, what knowledge about curation can we take from the real world and bring into the digital world? Those are very fun questions. And how can we realize those things through game design? Likewise for realizing the art, trying to realize the artist's goals with with what their artwork could be through these sort of uh 
game design strategies a lot of the time like that just th those are really i don't know intellectually satisfying exercises <laughs> well yeah there's a lot going on for sure a lot of different levels um sorry kat did you did you want to respond oh well yeah i was so um i latched on to this uh jonathan you explained the experience that we had really well, um, but I was thinking when Tom was mentioning that the concept of industrial imagination, how funny um, it is in the context of which we're trying to take um, this, this software, the game engine software Unity, and all the ways in which it is uh, really designed to pump out the types of media that people consume or that are like, um, you know, shooter games or like really like mobile games, uh, like re sort of reskinning the same few types of content, like perhaps, yeah, like a, sh like a shooter game or a mobile game, like it's some idle game or match three. Um, just changing the graphics on those types of games and then new people like putting those out all the time uh really limiting the kind of or okay, for, force placing forcible restraints on the kind of things that something that can really build or maybe has no limits in certain contexts of what it could create but what it encourages through the types of tools um that are available like on the unity store like you mentioned earlier katie sending um <laughs> sending around uh those the types of tools that are available are really trying to encourage specific use cases and in what kind of um experiences we have available to us and so yeah with this uh digital uh, the digital exhibitions toolkit and art installation launcher. We're really hoping that that, uh, even though we're we're still relying on some of those same tools that are um, very much industry in the game industry sense um, tools. Uh, we're hoping that to maybe uh, break from that those kinds of industrial imaginations of like these are the types of experiences that you can have when you're interacting with stuff on the on, online. Like what types of um, what types of experiences uh, that we expect from our from our devices, uh, from the, the the spaces that we interact with? Uh, how can the how can detail um, help bring artists into those spaces and curators into those spaces and make more considerations uh, for our digital lives? Um, that's what that's what I hope. Hopefully, <laughs> that's the grand goal. More art in this world, <laughs> please. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I was thinking about. Um how the show could come to be without like a cat and a Jonathan. And one of the things that sort of came out was this idea of like collaborating with AI, which brings me back to Tom. Um, and 2023, bringing this piece up uh, in the same sort of conversation as chat, GDP, the, the just sort of the massive takeover of AI and uh, and how it's it's evolving in pop culture sense. I just think it's so wonderful that this piece is part of the show as well. And I'm wondering in the context of the show being online and in this environment of uh, all these new forms of AI being disseminated, how you feel about looking back on this, this work or any thoughts on AI as it is now? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm obviously suspicious. I mean, there's, there's really been no innovations in terms of uh, artificial intelligence. We've just, there's been a culmination of a lot of work towards giving the ability of the machine to converse with us. <clears throat> you know, 1987, uh, my machine was mute because um, we really hadn't worked on all the voice synthesis modules and all of the uh, uh, pattern recognition systems and being able to simulate, uh, simulate human communication with a machine. We finally broken through on a lot of that. It's, but it's just as empty in terms of real intelligence. It's just a it's, a, it's a great grandiose mirror and it allows us to write better and it allows us to speak better and to design our prompts to be more accurate in terms of what we want to get back. And, you know, my, my, um, my prompt engineering was just simply, I just wanted to speak in natural language and I wanted to take a, a naive infant intelligent entity and um, not turn it into Frankenstein, right? But And not to make just a clone of myself. But in fact, I was really honestly trying to raise this machine in terms of experience so that it would be an interesting device to converse with. 
and it, it wasn't there then, but but uh, it's it's there now. So um, I I think you know it's it's a great gift for me to be able to bring that forward and to see it, and 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 really to see that the environment does does have uh, an imagination. And in this case, the imagination is my voice 36 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, that environment. It's the craziest damn thing. And, you know, I actually, because of my own egocentric uh, ability to, you know, pay attention to what I'm asking or what I'm talking about, it's a great space for me to go in and listen to that voice and hear it in a completely different way, you know? Mm -hmm. And and like I said, uh, and, and I, that's an interesting thing to me also is is that it's almost an impossible voice for other people I think to listen to that voice in that visual context, right? It it, it is a kind of a neutral space, but um, it's 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 not the best space, you know, the the ra radio space. I've worked in Europe for years, uh, writing these pieces, et cetera, for a, a limitless space acoustically. And this space is really, there's such a bias in terms of 3D and, you know, um, all we have for, for the most part in animation is percussive audio. We don't, we don't, we, we, we don't have really content-based audio, which is, I think, really bad because I don't know if you're aware, but, you know, we, we have two ears and we have two eyes and the ears are pretty important in terms of how we negotiate and learn about the world. And, um, uh, this this was not an ideal space uh, to deal with acoustic information. Um, thank you for that. Um, I just have one more quick question, and then if anyone has any final thoughts. But I was just going to ask Thoreau, did you end up clicking the cat? How many times did you click the cat, or did you spend time with the piece doing that? Clicking yeah, the box. Th mm, th thanks, Katie. Um, I think I clicked it a whole lot of times, maybe like, I don't know, a thousand, two thousand. I kind of lost count. Uh, <laughs> my my finger got tired and, and it started to slow down. But definitely there were there were huge, huge piles. And it didn't break. No, no, it didn't break. Would you be interested in having a, a number, a counter? Oh, yeah, in... for sure. For sure. Um, while I have the mic, uh, I just kind of wanted to... Um, make a quick uh, observation um, and a re request uh, of sorts. Um, the observation is that um, a lot of the experiences are solitary, right? So, you know, each one of us will check out each other's um, experiences on our own. So on our own browser, and these spaces are generally empty. And I, and I, and I know that's because multiplayer uh networked experiences are really um difficult and so so that was kind of the observation um and in terms of the re request um i've had the pleasure to um uh participate in a in a weekly seminar with fallon over the last uh three months we because we're in the same uh graduate program and um my research uh, it interests have a lot to do with the way that people connect in vir virtual worlds. So I was kind of hoping that um, all of you uh, might kind of keep me in mind over the coming year. Uh, anybody who uh, watches this video later at, at home, if you hear of projects or uh, artists or, or, or anything that kind of relate to not just virtual experiences and objects and galleries, but especially people connecting in them, I'd love if if you if you would think of me to like forward something, you know, drop me a little email or tag me or something. Cause how cool would it have been if like all of us, rather than sitting here looking at each other's faces, describing the experience, like actually walked, you know, through each of our worlds together and, you know, gone to your gallery or your ship or your room or your, you know, and like actually been there together. I mean, I know that's like a long, long ways off, but I don't I don't want to. I'm not going to promise this, but our because or I'm worried that I'll fail at trying. To, we will fail at trying to achieve that. But that's our number. That's like my number one technical goal for the next exhibition is to have it be multi-user. Um, this is amazing. at the end of the video, so hopefully no one will hear this if or this is towards the end of the live stream. So hopefully no one will hear this if we don't achieve that goal. But well, what's I that? agree. What do you mean? Like, what does it? What it look like? I'm just curious. Um, I am. Um, 
uh, what we're talking about now is using a we're, we're we're working with developers, so we're we're investing resources in into this, and we're using an already existing, um, uh, an already existing. I guess you could call it a, a plugin or a, a set set of like already existing set of software that works with Unity that would involve everyone having their own avatars and sharing the space and hopefully having voice chat as well, or sorry, voice communication. Um, yeah. So similar to a, a video game where you're, that's a, a space where everyone has their own characters unique their, or their own avatars unique to their, um, yeah, for, from that they're controlling from their own computers and where you can hear and talk to each other. Because I agree that that is like, that just seems so obvious to be what this needs <laughs> to have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you. To see if there's any interventions too. That's cool. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, thank thanks, Katie. Um, are there any final thoughts or anything else you'd like to share? Hey. I would just like to mention that no one in the chat, none of the viewers have yet to break the, the exhibit by clicking the cats, but they're going to keep trying. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, mysterious audience. Um, yep. And the show is up until May 24th. Mm -hmm. um, and as Jonathan and Kat were saying, there is another online show being presented by the McKenzie. I don't know when that's opening. Later. Don't think about it yet. About <laughs> Come it. see keep this an, one. <laughs> keep an eye out. Keep an eye out. You know, just share the promotion. Um, okay. But yeah, thank you so much. I found this so fascinating. I could talk to you all all day. Um, and uh, yeah, such a pleasure. Um, so take care. Everybody, thank yes. you for thank you everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the live stream. Remember to check uh, the exhibit out at www.thereisno.gallery.